welcome again to the NPTEL course on storage systems. I think we were looking at interfaces the previous class and I was trying to look at the POSIX interface. I think as I mentioned there are multiple aspects to POSIX. This is the POSIX 1, there is also POSIX 1B, there is also POSIX 1C etc. There are various uh, additions. Okay. This is the one which is very uh, let us say came early. POSIX 1B for example has things like asynchronous I.O and things like uh, memory related locking okay and then POSIX 1C came with threading, multi threading okay. So I am now discussing only those things that are connected with storage systems okay. I think some of this I think we looked at it briefly. Uh, for example, we talked about open DIR, close DIR, read DIR, okay, rewind DIR, right. So basically, you can take a look at a directory, it can be quite large and you can actually go through one entry at a time, okay. So you can open the directory and then the system will give you an interface by which you can read one entry at a time, okay. For example, if I say read directory, it will give me one entry and then I can and it will automatically increment the pointer to the next entry. So that next time when I say read directory, I will get a next entry, okay. Now I am not, I am insulated from how the directory itself is organized. As I mentioned, if it is a very large directory, you can be probably using hashing or other techniques to access this uh, entries in the directory, okay. So by having this kind of a uh, interface, you do not have to know how the directory is set up. Okay. Basically in UX, a directory is nothing more than a file itself. Okay. So the only thing is it has got some structure, directory has a structure, it has got entries, but how it is organized is left to the file system. So if you want to be independent of the file system, specific file system, you have these things like open DIR, so that you get an initial pointer to the first entry and then you can say given that pointer, keep reading it. Okay. So you keep on sequencing over the events, over the entries in the directory, okay. Of course, rewind directory will have some peculiar semantics possibly, it might, uh, okay, it, it basically resets the redirectory pointer so that it can go exactly to the place where you want, okay. Okay, and uh, there are various other uh, uh, things that you may have to, I think many of you are familiar with, for example, make dir, it makes a directory. Once upon a time, make directory was not a atomic operation, there is to be rest conditions because of these things. Therefore, it became later a um, an atomic operation, okay. Um, I think uh, when you talk about exact kind of functions, you notice that it executes a file, you might wonder what is the connection between this and storage systems. So let us quickly look at that. So, um, Mm -hmm. So, if you look at, um, if you look at a executable, you find the executable as, let us take this as executable. Mm -hmm. It might have some constants, some text, but basically it means code, okay. Then might have what is called data. Okay, and uh, essentially, there is also what is called uninitialized data, uninitialized data. This uninitialized data means it is the, uh, it can be initialized some values in the beginning itself, okay, text and some constants for example, okay. Now this is the actual code, I am again simplifying, but this is actually the object code, it is basically the executable. When you load it into the system, it will also have a stack here, the stack is going there, okay. Now 
what happens when you do an exec is that there are two possibilities. You can take the whole of this code and put it into memory, copy it. This is to be done in old systems which do not have what you might call virtual memory. Okay. If you do not have virtual memory, you basically read the whole text segment and put it into memory and execute it. Suppose you have virtual memory, then what you can do is you do not have to copy all this stuff, you just map it to memory. Okay. If you have once a virtual memory, what you do is you use some call similar to equivalent to mmap. Okay. What it is saying? It says mmap from this point up to this point map it to some memory location. Okay. Starting from this to this. Okay. Let us say the size. Okay. You map it this whole size into some memory location. Okay. So, this this is the file. Okay. This is the file and if this is the address space corresponding to that thing, I am just overlaying on top of it. This will be the only the part of the file. Okay. This part is the file from here to here. Okay. So, what you would like to do is you want to you want to have a memory area and that is the memory hole area and this will be mapped on top of it. So, basically what you are going to do is some of these pages may not be available in the beginning. In the beginning only some may be available. As you access them, they will get page faulted in. Okay. So, basically what you can do is you do not have to copy the full text part of it that is the code part of it from the file into memory first. You can just start with a few pages, start with a few pages. Okay. You map it, but you map the whole thing. You have to map this whole section, this whole section. Okay. You map it and then basically what happens is that, but you are not really reading everything. You just said that this part of it of the file corresponds to this part of the memory. Okay. The memory is not backed by, is backed by the file, but it is not still resident that information is still not resident. You start with the first few pages in the beginning and then as you keep going around you will get page faults and then it will be picked up on the disk onto memory. Okay. What is good? What is the idea about this? The idea is that you have a large program let us say your Firefox. Firefox has what is the size of the executable? It can be substantial, it could be 30 megabytes, who knows, it is nowadays 50 megabytes also. You notice that if you want to do the, if you do not have virtual memory, you have to read the whole stuff in and 50 megabyte reading will, will take at least a second okay, or more okay, depending on it. So, there is some delay in loading time okay, before, because the responsiveness of the application is not that much. So, what is the other idea here? Instead of waiting for the full thing to be loaded, I just map it and then as I execute, I will be traversing various portions of the program code. Wherever I, I will be branching, doing various things, depending on where I go, I load those many things. So, one thing is I am not loading the full thing, I am loading time is reduced. Other thing is I am using my memory better because I am only loading those portions which I am visiting as I execute the code. For example, if you take some very large applications, they have a lot of stuff and you might not execute all of them, you may execute only a small portion of that. For example, it may be that your editor has some support for encrypting your file and decrypting your file, but most people do not use encryption and decryption of files. So, it will be sitting in the address space in the file as some piece of code that will be executed only if you are interested in encryption and decryption, but most people do not see it. Suppose you have something like 10 other facilities in the prog program, most of them are not used, only one or two are used. So, if you take the previous approach of not mapping, then you will basically essentially stress the memory system. You bring everything in and use only a few of them, whereas if you use this notion of mapping and use the virtual memory subsystem to pull in whatever is needed as I execute. I am interested in cryptography, 
it will fault on the cryptographic code. It will bring it from disk. Again, it is back with the file. So basically, I have create what is called a mapping from the file to a memory region. So essentially, it is basically you have this file, it will be mapped to this will be the memory region and this part of it becomes the text part of it will be mapped here somewhere. Okay. And you only pick up those pages as needed, you do not take everything. Okay. So, this turns out that essentially the kernel has to do this mapping for you, okay. that is why there is a specific system called for doing it. Okay. It does all kind of other things so that the process can start. Okay. So, the exact v, exact various exact kinds of calls are basically about trying to automate this process. Okay. So, it requires some help from the file system. Okay. That is the reason why it is part of, uh, I am including it in this part. Okay. So, yeah, I think mo most of the things you might have to look at it by yourself. There is a lot of details. I think I, even a fork for example, it creates a process. When you create a process, it turns out that you have to uh, open and close certain file descriptors or you will have to do some things relating to what is called copy and write. Okay. So, all these things typically take support from the storage system. Okay. So, so that is the reason why this also is part of this uh, set of functions which are related to storage systems. Okay. So, the other reason why the fork is connected with the storage system is that uh, you often have required what is called swap space, swap. Okay. So, when you create a process, you may want, you may you'll also be duplicating the swap possibly okay. or you might do what is called copy on write on that one. So, to take care of all these things, again the file system has to come to the picture. Okay. okay. Now, let us uh, briefly look at the other part of it, which is basically POSIX uh, 1B, where you are going to provide some additional capabilities and uh, two sets of capabilities you can see, clearly see one is on what is called asynchronous IO, other one is what is called relating to locking okay, of memory region, memory regions. Okay. So, again so what is this uh, asynchronous IO? Basically there are two ways of doing things if you want to get parallelism. Either you have what is called multiple threads and each thread does synchronous reads. But because you have so many threads, there is parallelism. Okay. They are all doing synchronous reads. That is, I request something, I wait for it to complete. Okay. But since I have multiple threads, each one of them can read and it can get blocked, does not matter. But other guys are still running. So, either I have a threading system or I have an asynchronous system. Now, the threading system works out quite well in the user space because anyway I need those kind of models. The threading system in the kernel itself may be slightly more non-trivial to make it happen. Okay. That is why instead of going for a thread a multi threading the kernel, okay, sometimes people take the a different tack. They will say I will making my kernel multi threaded is going to be a bit complex. Okay. So instead of making my kernel complex, what I will do is I will provide asynchronous IO calls. What does it mean? It means that someone in application makes a request for an IO and then the kernel basically, basically you request a asynchronous IO and the kernel basically what does it do? It basically creates a, a way in which it can initiate it asynchronously and then when it finishes there is a callback by which it gets control, essentially it gets interrupted and then it is able to now report back what happened to the user program. Okay. So, you can support it by using certain slightly simpler facilities in the kernel. Okay. So, once you make those facilities available, then you can make the asynchronous IO available to user level. Okay. For example, if I say asynchronous IO read, 
what does it mean? It means that I initiate the process, but it is going to take at least some amount of time before like my, if I am using a disk for example, it will take some time before it can get to that place, it might be about 25 milliseconds let us say. So, while that is going on, I can do some other things and then later I can say, give me the status of that asynchronous operation, I can use this call. Now, this is at the user level, this A over read and A over return, but correspondingly in the kernel, when I do A over read, you will initiate the read and then provide some kind of agent which watches over when that read completes. So, when the read completes, it will interrupt the system and then you will couple it with the callback routine which will be look at what has happened and then finally, it will keep the status in some place. When you call A over return, again the kernel looks up that status that was there some time back after that operation right and then it will look, looks it up and gives you that information. Okay. Similarly, A over write, you can asynchronously write to a file, you can you can wait for example, sometimes you initiate asynchronous operation and then you do other things and then you come back and check if that thing completed, but you discover that it is not complete. Then you have other two choices, either you have other work to do or you really do not have any other work to do. If you do not have any other work to do, the best thing is to suspend yourself, that is what this is. Okay. This A was suspend is basically about in case you initiated asynchronous operation, you did whatever else you could do while this operation was while you are waiting for this to happen, but you you are through with everything, nothing else remains to be done. So, it has to suspend yourself, that is what this is. Okay. Similarly, you have A over error and it retrieves an error status for a asynchronous operation. You can also try to cancel it, it is not guaranteed that it will cancel it. Okay. Sometimes it can be done, sometimes it cannot be done. Okay. For example, if you ask for a read of a a sector, right? The minute you give it, it will start doing it, um, and then just a few milliseconds or uh, microseconds later, you say cancel it. It's not possible because the disk doesn't recognize that. Okay, but if it's a long thing, for example, you're writing, you, you are doing something like a four megabyte or ten megabyte or one gigabyte read or write, right? You can, in principle, it's possible for it to cancel, cancel the part which is still remaining to be done because a long enough operation that is possible. Okay. So, that is the part about asynchronous I O. Okay. Now, this is there in POS 6 1B, it was not there in the earlier versions of POS 6. There is also other aspects relating to uh, synchronization. If you do F sync, I think we discussed that you have what is called metadata and data. In F sync, basically, what happens is that you have to synchronize both the metadata as well as data. You have to flush everything to disk, then only you can come out. Okay. If you say F sync, every single thing that is sitting in memory has to be synchronized. So, when you want to be clear that you can shut down the system, you should try to do equivalent of F sync or somebody has to do it for you, F sync. Whereas, if you do F data sync, you are only concerned with the data part. Again, this is a database kind of people, for them the data is important, the money amount you have kept in your bank, whatever, that is important. The, if it turns out that they cannot do a full sync for whatever reasons, they can at least try to do a data sync and at least get the most important things in it. Okay. Okay. There is also some other operations like uh, doing a list of I operations that is I am asking it to read this, 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 I can make a list, I can do it, issue it synchronously that I wait for a whole things, to all the list to be completed or I can initiate each of them asynchronously, okay. that also is possible. There are other types of things relating to mappings and lockings corresponding to certain regions. Okay. Now, you have M lock for example, locks a range of memory. Basically, it is needed in case if uh, I got some piece of information, I do not want it to be moved out okay, till I am completely using this, used of that information. Okay. So, basically uh, it is required because you can, if you do not do M lock sometimes, you get into deadlock situations. Okay. So, 
uh, basically uh, let us say that uh, we will take an example. Suppose I, I have the following situation, okay. I have a file, file has got metadata, right? And the metadata basically is in terms of indirect blocks, okay, indirect blocks. What does it mean? It means that I have a file. If I want to access the blocks of it, I go through an indirection scheme so that I can access the blocks. Okay. Now, to be able to read the things, I have to have the this indirect block in memory. But indirect block memory is basically also in paged memory. Somebody can essentially push it out. Let us say if it is possible. Then what will happen? I am trying to read something. I need the indirect block in memory before I can do any operation to actually go and get the blocks corresponded. But I bring it in before I am done with it, somebody is coming and pushing it out. Let us say that is possible. Then I have a situation where I am not making forward progress. Okay. So, in those kind of situations, it may be worthwhile for me to lock it in. Now, I am talking about in terms of kernel memory right now, but you can come up with examples in user level also. If this happens user level, you better lock it down, okay, so that nobody is able to take it away from you. If somebody takes it away from you, then again you will have to bring it in and who knows, there is a condition in the system that you brought it in, but somebody is again taking it out from you. This keeps on happening, you get into a problem, okay. So, I am giving you a high level idea about what the issue is, but typically sometimes you need to lock it down. You lock it down, you get a you will be able to guarantee that some inform critical information you need is actually available to you. Okay. So, all right. So, basically, uh, we also have something like msync. Basically, if you have a mapping and you update the mapping it may not be flush to disk. Similar to fsync, what you want to do is you want to make sure that the mapping of the file whatever it is, if something has been updated in memory, but it is not there corresponding on the disk right, you might want to do msync on that. Okay. So, there is mmap already mentioned, usually you map a shared memory object or possibly another file into process address space and that is what is happening in exec. When you do an exec, you are basically mapping the file into the address space. That's what, that's what is going on. Okay. So, um, if you have locked it, you can the corresponding m lock is here. Okay. If you have an m map, there's a corresponding m map. Okay. So, it turns out from some of these things, there is usually some support needed by the support uh, uh, by the storage system because it depends on the because it depends on the backing. If the backing is on a disk or a file, then all these things will have some connection with the storage system. If the backing is coming from some other things unconnected with the storage system, of course, then there is a different story. Okay. Okay, now let us quickly look at device drivers. Okay. So, what is a device driver? Basically, for every physical device, you need a device driver that manages it. Okay. For example, you have to bring the device, initialize it, okay, or you may want to stop the device. Okay. That also, okay, both these functions. You may want to set the hardware parameters of the device, or in a sense, the device will tell the kernel these are my parameters. The kernel has to note it. Okay. Or the hardware the device has to be told certain things. For example, it may be that the kernel is a certain um, ways of allocating memory okay, in certain sizes. Okay. You may want to tell the device driver these are the sizes in units of 
we need some memory that you can get hold of. Okay. Okay. So basically, there is two way communication. The device has to inform the kernel about some parameters, special parameters it has got. Okay. For example, in olden days, we had something called floppy with uh, 1.44 megabytes or it could be 2.88 megabytes, it is double density, or it could be who knows triple density or whatever. It is the same controller, okay. But there is some once the controller once you put the floppy in, it knows whether it is single density or double density. Okay. The CPU does not know anything about it, only the controller knows it. The controller has to now inform the kernel that here is a double density guy or single density guy or whatever. Okay. The device driver knows about it, then it actually says okay, if double density it might decide to probably access it in this, it might use certain more compressed models which will be used to read the, read the things. Okay. Again of course, this, the obvious thing it has to do also is transmit data from kernel to device. If you want to write, retrieves receives data from the device for reading okay, and gives it to the kernel so that finally it can go to the user of the space. Okay. And if there are any errors, somebody has to handle it. It can be momentary errors or it has to be serious errors. Okay. Momentary errors means for example, on the bus, sometimes there is a conflict, you try to access something, somebody else also is also doing something which prevents the first access to go through, you may have to back off. Okay. So, you might get an error saying that it is no longer free okay. Okay. or whatever okay. because it could be shared resources and you have to adjudicate who actually gets to use it. Somebody could be partially using it and there is some period of time it is not being used and then you have to, it may be that you try to use it and you get a busy signal okay, saying that it is not currently available. Okay. So, these are innocuous errors, there could be one more serious errors bus errors with involving like uh, there are electrical errors. Okay. So, basically that the termination, there are some electrical signals traveling back and forth and those depending on the way the the transmission line okay, or the resistance and capacitance on that line, there could be some problems. Okay. So, you try to see if there is a way to recover from it, whatever you have. If it is not feasible, you have to just say I can't read the, I can't do anything with this. Okay, all the stuff is there. So, basically, if you look at uh, device drivers, there is no main routine. Basically, it is a bunch of code which is input inside the kernel, okay, and it is basically giving you some services: how to read the device, how to write the device, how to uh, manage the device, okay. So, and basically, all the routines that the driver provides is a way so that the kernel can call them. Okay. For example, there could be on a tape something called a rewind kind of a command. Okay. So, then uh, the kernel can say rewind and then the controller will essentially parse it and know that you are talking about rewind and then it will basically command the device to go to the beginning. Okay. It is a tape. Okay. So, there will be some set of functionality that is available for each device. Normally, this functionality is kept as far as possible generic. For example, almost all devices will have something called open the device, they will have something called close the device, they will have something called read the device, something called write the device etc. Okay, this are, there will be a few other things also, but that is particular to some the specificity of the devices, there will be some additional commands. Okay. But there is a core set of things that are typically always available. Okay. Other thing about uh, drivers is that typically parallel execution is expected, except for very simple device drivers. Okay. Extremely simple device drivers, it may do everything serially, but most device drivers parallel execution is something which is taken for assumed to be typically the case. Okay. Basically, what is the reason why? Because devices are slow, the devices are slow compared to CPU, you have to keep the devices as full, busy as possible. Any parallelism that will help it will keep all the uh, the device busy is beneficial okay, from the from the from the performance point of view. That is why the driver may receive a request to write data for a device while waiting for a previous request to complete. Now, what do you have to do? Do you create another instance of the driver or you handle the you basically have uh, uh, 
basically you can handle this contention problems okay. So, basically because there could be multiple interrupts coming in okay, we have to basically handle it make sure that this particular interrupt is for this particular request you need to match all those things okay. So, uh, and this is not really under the control of program because interrupts are coming from outside okay. There is no control uh, the only control you have is to disable interrupts that is the best you can do okay. But that is too gross a measure. So, the thing is it may be that there are multiple devices who are actively accessing multiple disks okay and each of them will be completing at different times and they will be interrupting the CPU and you have to figure out whose interrupt is for whom and then actually do the right things okay. So, there is lot of parallel uh, is parallelism in a drive device driver is possible okay and basically inefficient driver code can basically destroy the system. I think lot of you have seen sometimes that there is something stuck in the floppy or some other thing or a CD ROM right? okay and the guy is just sitting and uh, not allowing you to proceed with the system also you must have seen that happening okay. But that is because it is uh, happening at in the in the kernel but there is some problem and the kernel is trying to fix it or trying to figure out what to do during that time it is not accessible to anybody else okay. There are lot of possible differences in devices you can have what is called memory mapped IO or you can access something called IO space okay that is uh, instead of memory mapped you have an IO space right and uh, you may uh, if it is memory mapped what it means is that there is in the address space there are specific locations which map the registers of the device. So, the CPU just has to use those memory memory values okay then everything is fine. If it is IO space we have to use some specific instructions for example, uh, in Intel there is something called uh, um, I think it is called IO byte IO w something is there okay. Basically you can there are ports and you tell it which port it is and then you basically say read and write from that okay. So, uh, they do not use the memory inst memory uh, instructions they have a specific set of instructions which only deal with I O ports and then you have to say which port it is and then you have to say which uh, uh, which uh, part of that uh, set of registers that are there in the device okay access to that port you have to say which one of them it is okay. So, there are two types basically the memory mapped and I O space and these things for example, if it is memory mapped when the, the system when it is booting will assign a range of addresses to each controller and this controller might be for example, I might have one controller managing multiple disks okay. So, the controller gets one bunch of addresses and that in turn can be given to each particular uh, devices okay, that also is possible okay. So, there are other models like program IO. I think basically the, the CPU takes direct control of the sending out instruction and getting the basically it is waiting for it to complete okay. Whereas, we are using DMA basically you have an autonomous engine that is basically doing it for the CPU okay and in this case DMA turns out it is using typically uh, physical memory whereas, you can also use what is called DVMA which uses virtual memory okay. So, there are some complications if I you go either this route or this route. The good thing about going with uh, DVMA is that a CPU use does not have to worry about the physical mappings etc because it all deals everything in virtual memory. But then the devices has to worry about how to access virtual memory because it has to equal and it in a sense it, it needs a mapping also. The devices are now needs a mapping so that you can talk about what is there okay. If you do this physical memory okay the DMA programs using physical uh, addresses then there is a problem with it because typically these devices have only some amount of address space okay, the 24 bit or whatever it is and that might be quite different from what is there in the CPU. For example, I might have right now a 64 bit CPU, but the, the device because it is designed for a particular purpose it may require only a smaller number of address bits. So, it might not have 64 bit addresses it might have only have much smaller one probably it might have only 
28 bits or 24 bits or whatever ok. That means that somebody has to figure out how to make sure that whatever it is accessing you know fits into the virtual address space of the CPU ok. So, there has to be some adjustments made and there are uh, lot of device specificities that are involved here you have to figure it out when you are writing the device. There is also interrupts right. So, let us say that interrupt priority level of the kernel is 0 ok. Then basically you might if the arriving interrupt IPL is less than the current IPL of the system you block it. That means that you basically have a particular level and if an interrupt comes only above it you let the interrupt go through otherwise it is blocked. It is kept in abeyance and later when you if you reduce your interrupt level then it is actually looked at later ok. So, for example, some kernel routines you have to increment the IPL to block certain interrupts manipulation of disk buffer key. Basically because if you look at it some interrupts they manipulate the disk buffer key. Now, the kernel also manipulates the disk buffer key. Now, both the things if for the kernel while it is manipulating the disk buffer key if the interrupt comes in then it is possible that because it is uh, it can actually there can be a loss of synchronization ok mutual mutual exclusion sorry ok. There is if there is they are not mutual exclusion the mutual exclusion is not there then it can corrupt the data structures ok. So, that is the reason why you will find that certain kernel routines if they are manipulating this buffer queues they might say that I do not want any interrupts from which will actually also have something to do with the disk buffer queue probably the disk only ok. It might decide that the disk in interrupts relating to disk have to be blocked ok. They might do those kind of things ok. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Typically for each device there is a fixed level and uh, and all the devices on the controller. For example, a controller might have multiple tapes for example ok. One single big controller might be dealing might be managing multiple tapes ok, tape controller. So, typically all the devices on the controller have the same IPR ok, same level. These are usual, usually the case ok. So, um, usually when you you set the IPL to device interrupt level while saving the current value and then when you exit the handler you basically save that previously saved value ok. So, you basically restore it back so you restore it back ok. And uh, it turns out in some cases there are uh, in some operating systems instead of doing this blocking they are what are called blockable kernel threads ok. For example, Solaris does this ok. This is slight a different design compared to this one ok we will not get into it right now, but there are different designs possible here also ok. So, even there are quite a few possibilities here typically all interrupts invoke a common routine in kernel with some information to identify the interrupt. You have to identify the context, you raise the IPL to that of interrupt, cause the handler on return restores the context and returns it ok. So, the various things happen, hmm? but even here there are a lot of differences identification interrupt you do one called vectoring or by polling ok. So, there are multiple possibilities here also ok. So, usually the handler is uh, a quite an important part of the system because it runs in a priority bigger than that of the kernel ok. Because it is running at higher priority than kernel it is you have to make sure it runs only for a short period of time ok. In some sense the kernel is a supervisor if there is somebody who is a bigger than supervisor since the supervisor is not able to work he is managing the whole system right. So, you have to ensure that these handles have to be quick and they should not sleep if they block then the whole system can get blocked ok. So, these handlers they have to ensure that if they require any memory they pre allocate in the beginning they do not try to allocate doing the interrupt handler. If the interrupt handler knows that it requires memory you better pre allocate it you get it beforehand keep it with you do not try to do it at runtime you do it much earlier ok do not do it at the time when the interrupt happens ok. So, this is something which is uh, quite an important part when you write interrupt handlers you have to ensure that they do not sleep very critical ok. Again other thing is that you finished one part of the processing you check whether one more pending request is there ok. If one more pending request is there you initiate that thing and go ok. Basically in some sense you want to keep the device completely busy 
something finished, you try to handle it, you handled it and then you notice that after finishing it there is still one more request for the same device. Okay. Then you basically again initiate the next IO before you exit. Okay. All these things have to be done by these handlers. Okay. So now there are also differences in device drivers with respect to whether it is a monolithic kernel or a micro kernel. The interests are quite different. Okay. It turns out a device driver in a micro kernel is like an application, almost exactly like an application. Okay. Whereas in the case of monolithic kernel, they are most likely what is called a loadable module. Okay. What is a loadable module? It means that I can load it at runtime time and unload it at runtime. time. Okay. I may not have all the support for it in the beginning, but I see the device coming online and then I will load the corresponding module, kernel module corresponding to that particular device that is called loading and then once I am done with it, I can unload it also. That way I can reduce my memory footprint, I reduce the amount of <coughs> So, device driver requires kernel memory and other resources, also maybe physical memory for DMA because as I mentioned, if you have a DMA device, <coughs> it may only be, it may possible that it only understands physical memory, not virtual memory. Okay. That means that if these guys are talking to each other, the device and the kernel, they have to decide on what physical memory they are going to assume both of them know about. Okay. So, that when the device driver writes into physical memory, the kernel knows where to go and find it. Okay. So, they have to have some understanding. Okay. Similarly, you can have uh, devices which have memory, large amounts of memory. Okay. That can be mapped into the address space of the system. Okay. That also is possible. Okay. The good example is you have this uh, graphics cards. The graphics cards have, might come with large amount of memory okay. and the CPU might want to access it. And one easy way to do is take the graphics memory and map it to the kernel address space. Okay. And therefore, now the kernel has a way to talk about it. Both are essentially talking about the same thing. So, when the kernel writes to that kernel address space, it is equivalent to being seen by the graphics card. Okay. That also is there. Okay. So, there are various interfaces in the system, often times called DDI, DDK. One is device driver interface and there is a device driver interface to the kernel. Okay. So, what is this device driver interface? Basically, this is the thing which tells you how to get resources from the kernel and this one basically tells how the kernel gives, how the kernel can interact with the driver. Okay. Both ways there are essentially a device driver is loaded inside the kernel and it lives in the kernel once it is loaded and since it is inside the kernel, the kernel will provide certain primitives, for example, memory allocation. So, the device driver will need to use those primitives. Okay. So, all those things are encapsulated in these interfaces DDI, DDK and they serve for one more reason. One is that you want to isolate device drivers from differing versions of the kernel. The kernel can keep changing. I think if you are familiar with Linux, you will find the kernel keeps changing all the time. You write a device driver about 2 years back and then if the kernel interface changes, that means you have to go and change your driver also, which is a big problem. So, if you have a DDI, DDK, that problem is obviated. Okay. In a sense, you are, your driver is returned to a particular interface standard and it is expected that the kernel also will honor that standard. Okay. And that is what happens in commercial systems. Linux basically does not have that model. Linux basically says that because the source is available, you can always look at the kernel facilities and uh, you basically have to rewrite your driver so that it can use the new facilities. Okay. So, from that point of view, it is a slightly more challenging to live in a Linux kernel environment if you are writing device drivers because it keeps changing. That is why the device drivers you wrote 10 years from now most likely will not work right now. Whereas, in the case of commercial systems, it is usually there are various standards. They will say DDI, DDK version number 9 or 10 or whatever it is and you say I am programming it to DDI, DDK 9 or whatever it is and they provide usually a compatibility layer. So, that even if there is a slightly older device, if there is a compatibility layer, it will somehow do some translation and so that even the older device system, your older device driver still works with the new operating system, okay, that is possible. Okay. 
other reason why you need this is you want to isolate the kernel from hardware details okay. Basically you notice that if you are an operating system it wants to read and get some information in and out it can be through the network it can be through disks it can be through I would say terminals okay sorry not terminals let us say keyboards etc right from a kernel point of view it is just a read and write okay but each of these things are different a disk is different a terminal a keyboard is different a tape is different so one possibility is for the kernel to incorporate models of all these things in the kernel itself that blows up the size of the kernel I think if you look at Linux for example you notice that it is a fairly big system it has got some I think about now about 30 million lines I think the kernel itself is quite small most of the space is occupied by file systems and device drivers most of the space okay now it is very difficult to guarantee the correctness of a very large program okay written by so many different parties hundreds of parties okay it's very difficult to guarantee. Whereas the kernel itself, you can guarantee it. Okay, so if you make the kernel know have to know all the details for all the hardware devices, then the kernel is likely to be extremely brittle. It's not going to be working out very well. So the right way to do it is to say that I will isolate the kernel from hardware details. I have an interface, and if I have a very proper interface like VDK, then I can check for conformance also. Somebody writes a device driver. I check if he is using the the interface in the way it is supposed to be yeah? just like C language you know you have a lint program which checks whether you are using the things in a proper way right. Then if you see that it is being done then you can you know you have some chance that it is going to work some chance ok. So if you have the DDI DDK you can attempt to isolate a kernel of hardware details and the way it is done by is publishing a set of functions like I mentioned open close read write or there is something called IOCTL call. IOCTL call is some kind of a catch all call by which you can give some specific uh, device specific information and the device driver that is written for it will look at the device specific information and use it to understand what has to be done. Okay. But usually it is encapsulated as read write open close etc. Okay. So that all the devices will have the same things and the kernel only will call these routines open close etc. It will not call any anything that is specific to the device per se. It only calls these particular interfaces available in this DDI DDK. We will look at this soon. Okay, we will take a look at one simple device driver so that we get some idea about what is going on. Okay. So, uh, uh, so there are uh, if you look at a mic uh, micro kernel kind of base systems, it turns out that device drivers will be separated out from the kernel strictly separated out they will not live in the kernel also okay. and that is a very good design in the sense that as I mentioned there are so many device drivers any one of them can be wrong right because it is not written by the kernel hackers written by device driver device people who are designing the devices and they may not be as knowledgeable about the kernel as people designing operating system okay. So if you look at it the devices if you have the wrong device driver or a malfunctioning device driver they can essentially compromise the system. So whereas in a micro kernel what happens is that device drivers are outside the kernel because they are outside the kernel you can essentially uh, is there any bugs right the device driver process dies the kernel does not die ok. So that is one very strong point for going micro kernel. Uh, but so far this experiment has not worked very well most current operating system including Linux we are using the monolithic model, model where the device drivers are actually part of the kernel after loading ok. That means that the, the reliability of the kernel is not dependent on the reliability of device drivers ok and so and because uh, as I mentioned already the device drivers may not be returned by experts ok. So there is a problem there ok whereas micro kernel solves it but it somehow because of very other reasons it has not caught on probably in the future you might find some experiments in this direction ok. So let us just quickly look at uh, what are the things that 
the the device driver and the kernel they negotiate okay they can negotiate on some iv resources memory maps okay for example uh, it may be that some devices want to be preferably at particular locations or it may be that the address space itself has some restriction for example if you look at uh, the old ibm pc they had a restriction that all the devices will have their memory uh, locations between 1 megabyte and some 768 megabytes somewhere between that uh, 640 kilobytes to 1 megabyte so uh, 640 kilobytes to 1 megabyte that is again coming from the pc architecture definition not coming from the device part okay whereas it could be that as i mentioned earlier if your device uses dma and it's using only physical addresses then it may have only 16 pins but 16 pins that's usually about how many kilobytes it's only 64 kilobytes okay so it's the device is able to access only 64 kilobytes that means that whatever it is doing it has to fit into a 64 kilobyte area in the address space it might be starting at zero or it has to be at a particular offset only 64 kilobytes that, that that's the only window it has got so now they have to agree on where it is going to be okay or it could be a 24 bit uh, device uh, what's it a device with 24 bit addresses that means it can access 16 megabytes now it has to be now positioned somewhere in the address space of the kernel somewhere okay again that all these things are to be negotiated same thing about iva ports how many interrupt uh, request lines are there okay as i already mentioned dm addresses synchronization the kernel will have certain notions of synchronization okay for example if it's a uniprocessor it might do with certain types of synchronization mechanisms if it's a symmetric multiprocessing system it will have some more complicated set of synchronization primitives the device driver now has to use those primitives only okay so because the device driver is now resident in the kernel after loading it can only use those primitives that the kernel has provided to it okay and then uh, so there is a lot of dependence of the device driver on the locking facilities that are provided with the kernel okay and the modules for example it can be optional in the sense that some designs will say that you cannot load and unload at runtime okay whereas many systems will allow you to load and unload so the linux allows you to load and unload at runtime what is the problem about loading and unloading at runtime your security may be compromised okay? because somebody can by whatever means has got access to the system and is loading some insecure kernel module okay whatever okay he can create some complications so if you are looking for security serious security you probably will disable all this loading and unloading parts of it there is also a querying you want to see what are all loaded on the system because you are it is a dynamic system you are load unload things at some point you want to know what is what the state of the system is that is what you are querying okay and uh, device registration basically you have to uh, essentially what happens is that when you have a device you might give some you might want to be there might be multiple devices for example you might have 10 tape devices attached to it i want you to say which tape device i am talking about okay so there will be a what is called a major class which is about the tape class and then there will be a minor device number which is basically which specific tape device it is it could be tape device 1 2 3 4 etc so you might want to register the device how does the registration happen you attach the system is let us say already been set up you power on the machine and then somebody is going to look at somebody at the initialization time they will look and see who is on the bus okay it will probe it as it's called and then it will discover that because of electrical there is some there is going to be some intelligence in the bus system and this giving a simple example it will, it will discover there are four devices there then we'll say the first one is going to be and you can get a simple system first one will be the will have a minor number one second one will have minor number two three four okay somebody has to do it at at initialization time or it could be done later if you are what is called hot snappable devices i can do it at runtime that is uh, the system is already running 
I can insert a disk or I take out a disk. If I insert a disk, I need to give it a new minor number. Okay. The major number is corresponding to the disk driver because it is valid for all disk drives. Okay. But the minor number will be the corresponding to that particular device I inserted right now. And that has to be kept note of basically because I might have a variable number of disk drives. So, I have to keep track of it. When the new device comes in, I should be able to say, okay, this is the new number. When it is taken out, I might use some previous number which is no longer available. Okay. That disk is no longer available. Okay. So, I can do all those kind of things. And there is also a facility for querying it. Okay. We can look at it and say what devices are connected to it. Okay. And here there are a lot of interesting things that happen because in a disk you have to be very careful who actually has got access to it. If the wrong person accesses it, we can actually clobber the disk. Okay. So, typically on the disk you often have your own area on the disk which says that I am so and so I have grabbed this particular disk device and putting a specific marker on it or what you might call a magic number on it. So, that if the magic number is there, I know that I wrote it. If somebody has clobbered it or something of that kind, then know that something has happened to it. The magic number is no longer there. Okay. So, you need to do some of those things so that at all times you are clear about what is it that you are dealing with. Okay. If that light is not there, you can get into problems. Okay. So, a lot of issues out are there at this point in this kind of systems. And uh, what we will do next class is through go to we we'll look at one of these device drivers, we just go through high level what exactly is going on here. Okay. How is this particular system? How does it work? This is some device driver one of my students wrote long time back, about 10 years back. So, it will not work on current Linux systems, I can probably guarantee that. But the high level ideas are interesting, okay. simple enough that I can cover it next class. I will just go through it so that you will get a fairly good idea what device drivers are. Similar features are there in current Linux systems, you might have to go and study it to see how to run the same thing on this new Linux systems, okay. but uh, we will look at it uh, next class. Okay. okay, that is for all today.